sins and griefs to bear. What Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Thus far, O Lord, you have led us. You have granted us the benefit of your presence and your power. You have touched your people. You have solved countless problems. You have spoken expressly and distinctly to your people. Lord, at this hour, take us to yet another level. Perfect your will at this hour. The things you will do here, Lord, may they remain permanent. Thank you, dear Lord. As I open my mouth, fill it. And as your people incline their ears, speak into their hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I have a very short time to talk on the dangers of homosexuality in the church today, tomorrow. Perhaps I'll start with a personal story. When I entered the secondary school in 1964, I was a very young teenager and it was a boys school, a mission school, missionary to the core. But somehow amongst the student body was a young, another young boy who went to great extent to prove to us that he was a lady in a man's body. Our teachers did not know. Our prefects did not know. But among us, we called him a lady. And you know, a boys' school, no ladies around, just the boys. And when he began to show himself to be a woman, it started affecting all of us. It, in a sense, it began to play with our emotions. We were young people into adolescence. We were watching our bodies and the signals and instincts that were coming out of that. Somehow, we were intrigued and a little bit confused about some of the emotions we had. This young boy was very muscular, tall. I would call him an excellent specimen of manhood. But he began to act like a woman. And until we left school, we had a, we had a, uh, um, a word for girls then in school. That was what we kept calling him. And what ordinarily you would do with another boy, and it would not excite any emotion. If you did with him, it had some emotions. At that early stage, I saw the danger in homosexuality. I want to tell of some of us here, if we think that this issue is not important, we are making a mistake. Our children are being bombarded and bewildered by this scourge. And the problem is this. Homosexuality is not passive. It is aggressive. It is dynamic. It is advancing. Just in 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court passed a law that same-sex couples can, could marry. The other day, about a week or two ago, I was listening to the news. Two boys went to a man who, you know, produces wedding cakes and said, produce a wedding cake for us. We are about to wed man to man. And this man, a core Christian, so he said, I will not do it. They went to court. They said he was discriminating against them. And the court ruled in their favor that the caterer was discriminating against them. And so the court gave a ruling. If you will not make a cake for the gay couple, then don't stop making wedding cakes. That is what we face today in our society. So I will briefly touch on five different issues. What is homosexuality? What is the source? Is there any justification? There's what I call the gay manifesto. They have some arguments. How reasonable is that? What should be our response as a church? 
what must the church do let me quote uh, mention some quotations here a writer put it this way he said the church must be careful not to adopt the customs of the world what we tolerate today our children will practice tomorrow in an age of accommodation and compromise when churches are more interested in numbers than genuine conversion the church is in danger of ceasing to make holiness and truth the motivation for its existence another person said and i quote the most effective and biblical response is to recognize every sin as serious requiring repentance from the practitioner forgiveness from god and that delicate balance of grace and discipline in the church's response it is a, like a summary of what is expected of us for the practitioner repentance for from god we expect forgiveness and for the church a delicate balance of grace and discipline yet another writer said satan has unleashed a plague and some confusion on christendom with a well-planned strategy make no mistakes about it this is part of satan's plan to pervert god's creation and his holy word satan ultimately wants to infiltrate and to finally lead the lord's churches into rebellion against god with him and jesus asked a simple question he says are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of god have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female praise the lord so what is homosexuality in simple terms it is a pattern of sexual emotional and romantic attraction between persons of the same sex there are many variations of it lesbianism is woman to woman gay is man to man bisexual is being attracted to persons of both genders there are some who are asexual they are attracted to their own sex they are attracted to the other sex there's also the one they call transgender this one goes beyond or outside the two genders in fact germany just within the, this month but you know took a, the law the supreme court took a gave a ruling that there are not just two genders in official documents you can't say male or female tick which one it is say there should be the possibility of a third one so male female and there may be a trans, whatever the third one is so it's growing there is also asexual those who have zero attraction to any of their gen genders then there is pansexual they have sexual romantic physical and spiritual attraction for all gender identities and then transsexual different they, they have a, an inclination different from their biological sex so these are all the different shades of homosexuality the question is is homosexuality a normal or a natural variation in human sexuality or is it an unnatural deviant behavior that calls for corrective and therapeutic action the gay manifesto says that there are three basic arguments that favor homosexuality they said people are born with it it is innate it is inborn it is normal it is god ordained and so if you are not happy with them you are dealing, treating them the way you, you are treating the minority uh, people of the world african americans and women and children they ought to be given their self-respect another argument is that there are decent people who are homosexuals they have become key figures in society and so 
since they are decent respectable citizens the issue of homosexuality is insignificant and irrelevant that's the argument and the third issue anybody who opposes or criticizes them is regarded as being intolerant they call it homophobia gay bashing and they liken it to anti-semitism and bigotry of the worst type the truth of the matter is that secular society has capitulated to pressure from the gay and lesbian community accepting homosexuality as a legitimate lifestyle if we begin to mention some of the very notable television personalities one of the uh, very well-known entertainment figures announced I am gay and everybody is jumping up and down and um, wondering so what's wrong with that the issue is this anytime we raise a protest against homosexuality it seems as if we are trying to throw them away the issue is not to throw away the baby with the bathwater. the issue is to define what we face and define how the church will uh, come, uh, face this threat now whether celebrities and popular figures are homosexuals or not we can always distinguish between good traits and wrong behavior good people can do bad things and bad things cannot be reclassified just because of the goodness of the people who do them there are many questions that linger is homosexuality a matter of right or wrong or just a matter of taste and inclination what does God say on homosexuality does the Bible approve of the lifestyle is homosexuality a genetic disorder or is it a matter of choice in need of psychological intervention homosexuals guilty of practicing a sinful lifestyle or are they simply living out their God ordained function what should be the attitude of the church to homosexuals what danger does the practice pose for the church now this paper posits that in my view there are three basic roots so the what we uh, describe as homosexuality number one broken culture our culture has fragmented and, and is broken our core values are eroded and somehow the things we used to hold dear we no longer hold them dear the second one is supernatural or spiritual intervention we are saying that the issue of homosexuality is a spiritual matter also there is a contest of spirits there is a spirit in culture that contests with the spirit of Christ and a Christian should not be should not make any bones about it most often when we fight the battles concerning culture we stand on very slippery grounds we don't realize that we are dealing with spiritual realities and the third one is that our society has lost sight of truth somebody calls it the post truth period there are many things we could say about culture but let's not go too far when a society like United States established by missionaries and purists and in their constitution they wrote in in God we trust now they forbid every mention of God or biblical morality in public life and anybody can go to court and sue you a, lay, a, a preacher was preaching in a church and he was condemning adultery and a lady in the congregation said he, he was referring to her and she sued she went to court asking for some compensation that she was being embarrassed the culture is broken and is breaking down anytime a culture is rupturing there are two possible causes from within or from outside what makes a culture to 
you know, to decay from inside. When we begin to skew our reward system, not in, in favor of things that build character, but things that don't matter. When materialism becomes the cornerstone of our conviction, when the quality of people we breed are no longer the kind of people who will hold aloft the flag of truth and honesty, when our values take a plunge, that is when the internal forces are working to destroy the culture. And at that point, all we need to do is to recreate our core values. Then the other one is the imposition from the outside. I don't know how many of us know, remember, that all of North Africa was a Christian enclave before. But now the, Muslim, the is, is Islamic faith, the Muslims, have swept through the entire region. How many of us still remember that Turkey, Istanbul, all those areas, they have covered the places where the Apostle Paul went to preach and had such a good outing. Today, they are all Muslim. That's what happens when our values break down and there's an imposition from outside. A pastor in the United States puts it very well. He said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We have ridiculed the truth of God, God's word, and we call it pluralism. We worship other gods and we call it multiculturalism. We endorse perversion and we call it alternative lifestyle. We reward laziness and we call it welfare. We kill our unborn children and we call it choice. We neglect to discipline our children and we say we are building their self-esteem. We abuse power and we rename it politics. We embezzle public funds and we say they are essential expenses. We institutionalize bribery and we say they are suites of office. We covet our neighbor's possession and we call it ambition, faith. We pollute the air with profanity and pornography and we say it is freedom of expression. We ridicule the time-honored values of our forefathers and we say that is enlightenment. May God help us in the name of Jesus. What we are saying is that the time has come to look again at our values. Many years ago, in Bible days, Nebuchadnezzar, under the, the mercy of God was working for him, he raided Israel and Judah and carried away the youths. And when they came to Babylon, he selected the best from the bunch. Youths of noble birth, intelligent, handsome, no blemish. He selected the best, the cream of the crop, and he began to work on them. What were the names of the three Hebrew slaves that came out of the furnace? What are the names? Beautiful. Nebuchadnezzar succeeded. Hello? Nebuchadnezzar succeeded. He changed their names. Their names were not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Names that had a lot of meaning. Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. He was given another name, Shadrach. Shadrach means I am fearful of Aku's command. Their God, Aku. Michelle means who is what God is. He was given another name, Mesh Meshach, which means who is like Aku. The third one, Azariah, means the Lord has helped me. And he was given another name, Abednego, meaning servant of Nego. He changed their names to, in order to change their spiritual loyalty. He changed their meals in order to change their basic approach to life. He changed their language and their teaching. Everything about them. That's what we are experiencing in the challenge of today. And we are saying that these things are spiritual challenges that the church will do well to look up to. We are not going to go into the theory of what truth is or what truth is not. But we are saying that when we begin to look at truth again, the way Jesus looked at it, 
our entire perspective will change we hold that truth is absolute it is not just subjective we hold the fact that God had said has something to say about truth there is also a difference between fact and truth Moses sent spies to spy out the land of Canaan when they went and came back ten men reported what they saw two men reported what they believed ten men said the place there are giants all over the place the cities are fortified there's no way we can begin to take that land in fact as we looked at these men we looked like grasshoppers in our own eyes there's no way we can approach them they will overcome us they will overwhelm us they were stating the facts two men said no sir the truth is what God has spoken if God has not said anything about that matter don't conclude yet but if God has said let God be true let all men be liars and so they said we are able we will use the giants for breakfast and that song we are able to go up and take the country and possess the land from Jordan to the sea though the giants may be on our way to hinder God will surely give us victory victory only move on to the righteous side move on the righteous side move on to the righteous side with God hallelujah move on to the righteous side move on to the righteous side move on to the righteous side with God praise the Lord so are you standing just for the facts or are you standing in the truth what is the truth about homosexuality Jesus said some words let's quote them he said sanctify them by your word your word is truth the word of God is truth that's John chapter 17 verse 17 elsewhere he said I am the way I am the truth I am the life no one comes unto the father but by me John 14 verse 6 elsewhere again he said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free John chapter 8 verse 32 and then and the tail end of his ministry he said for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth everyone who is of the truth hears my voice John 18 17 when we allow Jesus the truth to speak in our confusion all things will come into sharp and clear focus so what is the testimony of scriptures the scripture is very clear God uh, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman both of them have committed an abomination that's the scripture you know one of the things that is often said is that the word homosexuality came into use about 1869 when a German writer wrote it in a uh, used that language in a book but before the term came up the Bible recognized the practice and condemned it in his letter to the Romans Paul said God gave them up to vile passions the men leaving the natural use of the woman bond in their lust for one another men with men committing what is shameful God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Elsewhere he said, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, 
nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. to These are hard and uncompromising words. And Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus was saying that the implications are God made marriage for man and woman. And God is the author and final authority over matters of human and sexual orientation. It is God's institution, not man's, and his rules must apply. Having said all that, what are the things we need to note about homosexuality? Without being uh, aggressive or unusually doctrinaire about it, homosexuality is a social problem. It is also a moral issue. It is further a cultural matter. And finally, it is a topic for intergenerational contention. It is not just a neutral matter in the symphony of life. It is dangerous. It weakens the fabric of society. I have seen a lot of homosexuals adopt children. Why adopt children if you think it is normal for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman? The presumption is that you don't need children. So why go out of your way to adopt? Any society that does not reproduce it will soon be uh, 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 will soon go into extinction so it is it renders a society vulnerable to attack from both outside and within let me mention a few facts it was discovered in US that the gay population the homosexual population is only about 2% but they account for 61% of reported cases of HIV in the country it was discovered that the amount of money spent treating homosexuals because of their practice is a, in excess of 12 billion dollars annually because their practice exposes them to a lot of health hazards it's also discovered that homosexuals are open to a lot of psychiatric disorder they are 50% more likely to suffer from depression. The risk of suicide is 200% higher among them than outside in this outer society. And their lifespan is on the average 24 years shorter than that of a heterosexual. In other words, there is no way you can look at it and justify it. There is also the sexual promiscuity it was discovered that 28 percent of homosexual men had had more than 1,000 partners in their lifetime 83 percent of them have been involved in sexual relations with 50 or more partners and 43 percent are estimated to have had sex with 500 or more partners in other words the level of promiscuity there's no way you can begin to describe it so it goes on and on and on. Their sexual orientation may open the door to other people. Pedophiles, voyeurism, necrophilia, bestiality. But that is the question I ask. If homosexuality is a human rights issue, who will guarantee that in 10 years time, it will not be a human rights issue for a man to insist that he should wed his dog or wed his cat just wed his pet oh so i hear they're already doing it in parts of the u.s in fact i think it's either california or so they say there's no law that forbids a man from marrying his pet so you come to the wedding and you are saying who joins these people this man and dog together god help us So is the, is the challenge. So what should the church do? And uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we couldn't play the pictures. We really 
captured some of their sins to bring out the way they relate the issue is they laugh they say this is now freedom we are enjoying but I have news for all of us men can go to hell laughing but there will be no laughing in hell hello men may go to hell laughing but there is no laughing in hell may God deliver us so the church must with compassionate conviction condemn the practice we must be compassionate yet we must be convinced it's not a matter of negotiation somebody comes and says he commits adultery and we start negotiating with him about adultery when you repent of it God will show you mercy the church must condemn the practice and when he's repented of it should also be covered by the grace that God provides in Christ we must our duty is to uphold to be kind polite civil to all men and yet uphold the veracity of scriptures the Anglican Church has been defined as a pattern of the faith that is liturgical in worship parochial in organization Episcopal in oversight pedo-baptist in practice and established in relation with the state we have a testimony of faith and conviction of the early church reformers who sealed their testimony with their own blood Anglicanism is a purchase of blood we cannot at this stage trifle with this there are three key issues we stand on Anglicanism the word tradition and reason the word of God is not in support of homosexuality the tradition of the church is not in support of homosexuality and reason common sense does not also support the practice of homosexuality somebody says it's innate I was born with it so were we all born sinners everybody was born a sinner yet God has had mercy on us and pulled us out of the cesspool of sin that a man is born with something does not mean he is condemned to be that thing all his life that it is inborn does not mean that he cannot be corrected and when something is inborn it does not mean that it is good the origin of a thing may be you know may stand against good practice and good conduct it is the duty of the church to point this out so what should be the biblical response recognize all sin as serious requiring repentance from the sinner forgiveness from, from God and the balance of grace and discipline in the church's response somebody said and I quote we hold convictions based on a particular worldview not prejudices we believe that the Bible has specific instructions for how we should conduct our lives the church is neither the master of the state nor the servant of the state rather it is the conscience of the state so if, if, as we pull it all together what are the responses from the church we call it the four C's number one condemned homosexuality it is a perversion of divine order and steer men away from the brink to the hope that is held out in Christ when people know that this thing is bad then we start talking about how to rectify the, a bad situation but let's not play games about it condemn the second one is convert the homosexual the church is an agent of change it's not enough to just condemn and move away we are God's vehicle for extending his love his mercy and his grace to every sinner in need of God's grace it takes the power of God to lift the sinner out of darkness into light we must help the homosexual and the help is conversion thirdly we must confront error let's not play games error is error the word of God may be rare 
I was reading the story about first, in First Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. How Samuel emerged as God's prophet at a very tender age. Maybe around 7 or so. You go back to First Samuel chapter 3 and read the first four verses. He said the word of God was rare in those days. And open visions and revelations were very rare. And somehow, the high priest was going blind. He couldn't see very well. Even the light in the temple was just, just before it went off, flickering. Everything showed a downward trend. And God decided to do an unusual thing. In our place, there are certain things you don't tell a small boy to go and tell an elder. Don't send a small boy on an errand. Tell him to go and tell that elder, elderly man that what he's doing is wrong and he's going to receive punishment. You don't do that. But God had to do it. The situation was desperate and the malady had to be unusual. So, when there are things like that, we need to step out and do what needs to be done. The church must stand as a bastion of truth against every form of error and immorality. We must not abdicate our role as guardian and defender of the truth. And the fourth C, cleanse and purge the church. If it becomes necessary to excommunicate, excommunicate. If someone we have petted, we have begged, we have cajoled, we have negotiated, we have pleaded, and it's not working, bring on the discipline. The church needs to do that. We must address every deviation from the truth and strive to earnestly contend for the faith. Jude said we must earnestly contend for this faith that was once for all committed to the saints. There's no middle way. It's either they are there or they are not. One thing about error is that it starts very small. I was reading Genesis chapter 3. I was wondering how the devil had the courage to say that God was lying. He said, look, did God say you can eat of all the trees in this place? I mean, you, you may not eat of any tree here. He knew that was not what God said. When he said it, what did the woman say? Adam's wife said, no, 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 God said we may eat all the fruits. But the one in the middle of the garden, we should not even as much as uh, touch it. Did God say that? Eh? Are we asleep? Did God say that? Immediately he said that Satan knew that he could break through. Anytime we add or subtract from the word of God, we lay ourselves open to enemy attack. And so he said, no, it's not true. And then that's how error stra starts. Straying, wandering from the truth. It may not be deliberate. It may be accidental. That's error. But when, it, when you go beyond error, you enter into heresy. Heresy is deliberate. When there is a denial of revealed truth, you know the truth and you're denying it. It's a voluntary choice of self-conscious commitment to that which is false. Error may be tolerated in fellowship because you want to teach the person to understand better. But heresy passes beyond the permissible bounds of fellowship. And then of course the last, apostasy. Complete abandonment of faith. A dissolution of the union with God. Subsisting, subsisting true faith in Christ. A rebellion a falling away often what starts as innocent error soon graduates into heresy and Thank you. 
from the promised land. If you look around the world today, one thing is obvious: the coming of the Lord is much nearer than what we first believed. Everything points to the fact that time has arrived. We are not going into the time, and in due time, it takes us out. Everybody senses it. The money is the most that senses the tradition.
sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit.